welcome to Crime and Court. My name is Heather and this is another episode or stream in the um, in the Innocence Lost series that I am doing and each week I pick a particular person or persons tied to the same crime uh, who were wrongfully convicted and possibly exonerated or maybe even still sitting in prison and uh, talk about their stories and their road to exoneration. So this week I'm going to do something a little bit different because I've been talking a lot on my channel about the read technique. We've been watching all of the um, police interrogations, all six police interrogations of Brendan Dassey in the um, Truth Behind the Making a Murderer series that I'm doing, the deep dive in. And so I really wanted to talk about the read technique just because, you know, we've been talking about it a lot lately and I think it's important to, to be aware of. So please, before we get started, hit the like button, subscribe, let your friends know that this is out there and let's begin. So I'm going to go over some different papers and things that I've, that I came up with in my research. So basically, let's go over what the read technique is. This is a paper written by the behavior analysis team. And I'm just going to go over some highlights here. So uh, it was the read technique is a widely or a recognized and debated method of interrogation in the field of law enforcement. It was originally formulated and elucidated by John E. Reed and Fred E. Inbaugh in their book, Criminal Interrogations and Confessions, which I highlighted 1962. That's how old this book is. That's how old their technique is. And we're still using it and we haven't changed. We know things now about the human psyche and what happens when you lie, manipulate, do all these things. We know there's research now that this technique is not the best. It's great at getting confessions, whether you are guilty or not, you might confess if you are under the read technique line of interrogation. So this technique is based on certain underlying assumptions about obtaining confessions during criminal investigations. According to Inbau, the primary assumption of the read technique is that many criminal investigations can be resolved by obtaining a confession from the suspect. So to heck with the investigation, you don't need to actually investigate if you get the, the suspect's confession, then you, you, you save yourself a lot of work. So just get their confession and move on. <laughs> Basically, this approach is especially effective when offenders are not caught in the act committing the crime and require a prolonged period of interrogation using persuasive tactics that may be perceived as ethically questionable. The read technique follows a structured and strategic approach that aims to create a psychological atmosphere conducive to obtaining confessions. It involves several distinct steps, each serving a specific purpose and designed to break down the resistance of the suspect. So I'm going to flip to this other document here that I have, which is the actual, the nine steps of the read interrogation. First is direct positive confrontation. So you're going to present the case, kind of a synopsis of fact to the, the suspect. You might reference evidence, real or fictional, because you can make up lies and say, we have you on camera doing this when they didn't, and you don't. <laughs> suspect um, is told that he is involved in the crime. So you say, we know you did, so we know you're involved in some way. You don't say what you know, but you just say, we know you're involved. We know you had something to do with this. We know you were there that night. Those kinds of kinds of statements. Uh, behavioral observation of the suspect. So the interrogators are going to observe the suspect. And there are multiple ways in which they might find a suspect to be lying. 
if someone's not making eye contact, if someone is slouching in their seat, if someone says, I don't know, those are all ways that we know someone's lying. These are all according to the read technique, which is so bogus. All right, so behavioral observation, like I said, someone slouching, Brendan Dancy was slouching in his seat the whole time he was being interrogated and the cops must have been like, well, he must be lying because he's slouching. And a restatement of confrontation stronger or weaker. So you want to, in this step one part, you want to restate it again in multiple ways, potentially to confront the person as to how they did it, what they did, how you were there, what did you do, do you have the weapon, da, 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 da. You know, you want to get more um, focused, I guess. Well, maybe not focused, but you want to keep re enforcing that narrative that that person was there because it'll they'll start to possibly believe it too step two theme development so this is where you transition the investigator transitions from uh phases from confrontation so you might be less confrontational more confrontational you want to you want to keep it different at different times. You're going to propose reasons that will justify or excuse the commission of the crime. So in Chris Watt's case, if you've ever seen the, his confession, and he very likely did it, but, um, <laughs> and I'm not saying that the read technique doesn't work on guilty people, because it absolutely does, but it also works on innocent people, which is the problem. So um, with... Chris Watts, he, you know, they kept saying like, well, well, maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe it was Shanann who did it because he, he started going down that line of questioning. Well, Shanann ended the lives of the daughters and then he ended Shanann's life, which made him less culpable. That was one of the ways in which he confessed. And then later he did confess to more and more. Uh, but, but a lot of that has to do with, you know, police trying to pick that little bit of information out of him to say Shanann did it, and then I had this little part in it. Just this little part over here. Shanann did it all, but I'm, I'm this little sliver over here. They make him think that way. Uh, they make him minimize uh, different things. Um, minimize the egregiousness of his crime. All right, so behavior assessment of the suspect is also continually happening. So if you change the theme or you change... Um, the way you confront them, uh, the way that you confront them about the evidence, whatever it might be, if they start adjusting to the way that you're changing your way of um, telling the narrative or, tell, you know, creating the theme of the crime. All right, so number, step three is stopping denials. Both guilty and innocent deny the crime at issue. Okay, that, <laughs> then how can you tell? Um, but they can tell that if you're denying, it's probably because you're guilty. So in the read technique, anyways, so at this stage in the technique, you're going to, um, start, oh, oh the guilty part, I guess, or denying their guilt may start, you want to continually start from the beginning to keep them away from saying that they're innocent because it just solidifies their narrative when you want to feed them your narrative that they're guilty. All right, so the interrogator recognizes and stops denial before it's complete. So if a interrogator says something, like, I know you were there, just tell us the truth. And then the suspect starts to say something, well, I was actually at a different, at three o'clock, I was in my home, in my classroom. And obviously, I couldn't have been there and then when they start to say that then the investigator has to step in and say but we know you did it we have you on camera or that type of thing so they're going to cha keep changing and stop your denials all right and then progress is indicated by secession or weakening of denials so basically they're trying to destroy your confidence in your own story that happened so if you are confident in your story and i did not do this they're trying to break that down and weaken you 
Overcoming objections, the suspect proposes a reason why he allegedly did not commit the crime. Well, I couldn't have done it because I was at 7-Eleven at this time of night. And I didn't, I never go to that gas station. I go to that gas station with the 7-Eleven. <laughs> so, you know, before they can start to say that, you want to, um, you want to deny, you want to stop their n denial up front. But if they continually are objecting, then um, normally offered by only the guilty. Does that mean normally offered? I don't know. Um, indicates progress in the interrogation if given after denials. So if they, if they start to give a reason why they didn't do it, then that only indicates that you're making progress in the interrogation. Even if they've been denying it the whole time, obviously you're making progress, you're getting to them. Handled differently than denials by first listening and accepting. So going, uh-huh, uh-huh, I hear you. I hear that you went to that 7-Eleven, but can you be sure? Because this guy, Joe, over here says that you were there. You were at this other gas station, you know. So that's how they do that. Um, handle differently than others. Okay. Proper handling of objections helps overcome the sus subject's defenses. Again, they're trying to break you down. They're trying to take away your convictions of being innocent. <laughs> they want to break you down and make you think you're guilty by any means necessary. Step five, getting the suspect's attention. The suspect is on the defensive and is tense and confused at this point. Well, yeah, because you're in their head and lying to them and telling them things that aren't true, like you have them on tape doing this when you didn't. So then the themes will work only if the suspect is listening. So you have to remain with your theme, whatever your, your narrative is. Or, you know, you can even throw out other narratives, but it only works when the suspect is listening. The interrogator reaches a peak of sincerity in his speech. So he becomes the most sincere guy right now, trying to get your attention. Like, look, we know, Brendan, Dassey, that, you know, your uncle is no good. And uh, he's done all these crimes in the past. And we don't want you to go down for his crimes because he's trying to take you down. He's calling you out and saying you did all of this to Teresa and he didn't. That's when you get the, the, their attention. They start listening. They start thinking they're the ones that are in trouble. Um, the interrogator reaches the peak. Okay, physical closeness and use of verbal techniques to command attention. This bothers me to the nth degree. You do not invade my personal space. No, no, no. Don't get close to me. Don't touch me on the knee. Don't tap me on the back. Don't touch my shoulder. Don't pretend like we're buddies, Mr. Cop, who's trying to coerce a confession out of me. It's so disgusting. And they do it. They do it in all inter interrogations, but well, maybe not all, but most that I've ever seen. And um, they s definitely do it to Brenton multiple times. And it's disgusting to watch how they just like impede on your own personal space and make you feel uncomfortable. Um, verbal techniques and command attention. So yeah, the officers now they have your attention. So they got to start saying certain things that are going to get your attention. Physical gestures and sincerity are used in a, to establish attitude of understanding and concern. So again, like you still want to act like you're understanding, you're concerned about their safety, you're, you're understanding about that the crime that happened and how it happened and you know there's no, it's no big deal that you did this you can go home brendan if you just tell us the truth all right <laughs> just drives me crazy all right so then the su six step six the suspect quiets and listens you've got their attention now they're listening to you the physical signs of surrender begin to appear the themes are shortened and lean toward alternatives. So you can start to throw in alternatives here because it's, you know, maybe Shanann did do it, Chris. Maybe it wasn't you. Maybe Shanann got angry and violent and hurt the girls. And you were only protecting the girls. Tell us, Chris, what happened? So that's how you get their trust. All right. So 
and get them to break down. The themes are shortened. Establishment of eye contact is most important at this point by verbal and physical techniques. So you definitely like you're sitting right next to them. You're in their space. You're you've got your hand on their knee. You're you're making sure that you two are engaged in the conversation physically. Eye contact. You know you're you're there. All right. So then there might be tears at this stage that indicate tears or tears tears that in this stage positively indicate the suspect's guilt. So you're going to start, or the, the interrogator doing the read technique starts to see all these tears within their story now. And we believe that that means they're guilty because they can't keep their story straight or whatever. But at this point, like, You've already gotten into their head, so nothing even matters about what they say afterwards. But All right, so step seven, uh, alternatives. So you want to be non-threatening to the suspect at this time. Um, and concern some minor aspect of the crime. Non-threatening to suspect they concern some minor aspect of the crime. What does that mean? I don't know, gives choices between acceptable reason and unacceptable reason for committing the crime. So again, um, obviously you did it because Shanann was hurting them or we know you didn't do it on your own. Stephen forced you. He, he said he would, um, I don't know, make up something. And uh, he said he would tell your parents if you didn't or something, he would tell on you. I don't know. I can't think of an example right now, but basically, yes. It's alternatives. Give, um, give them a choice. So it could be this or that. One alternative is stress to lead the subject to choose the positive alternative. So it's like, well, you either ended her life in a fit of rage and jealousy, or maybe you ended her life because... You were so upset and angry that she cheated and it's totally acceptable. We understand, you know, it, it's acceptable to be angry that she cheated on you type of thing. Um, either choice, though, is an admission of guilt. So you give them one or the other and they're both guilty. There's not an innocent in there. You're, you have one option or the other. So obviously, this one over here, if you admit to this, you get less time. But if you admit to this, well, buddy, I can't help you. <laughs> Whatever, you know, that's how the cops do it. So step eight, bringing the suspect into the conversation. The So now, notice how we haven't talked about the suspect even talking yet up really until this point. So now the suspect can start talking. This is now step eight. So... The previous seven steps were all law enforcement trying to get their narrative out through the suspect and through their coercive and manipulative tactics. So you finally bring the suspect into the conversation at stage eight. The acceptance of one alternative is reinforced by the investigator. We know you did it because she cheated and you were, um, you were upset. And you, you knew it was affecting the kids and da, da 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 All right, so the suspect is encouraged to talk about the aspects of the crime now. Now they can start saying, well, yeah, I got the, the sledgehammer out when I was angry, whatever. The use of realistic words is introduced by the interrogator. So instead of um, being more generalized in your descriptions of things, you can start to be more specific about specifics that you know of the crime scene. Uh, initial co cooperation by the confession is begun. So we start to cooperate things that it, the suspect starts to cooperate things that the police have lined out in their narrative. So because all this time they've been talking for those seven steps, they've already laid out the narrative. It's now your turn as suspect to regurgitate it back to them, basically. Um, all right, so oral witnessing of admissions by two persons. 
it is a confession. You have at least two law enforcement officers in the room with the person and they and video recordings. And that is a public witnessing of someone admitting to a crime by those law enforcement agent officers. And then finally, the confession. So step nine is the confession reduction of oral statement into written, typed, or electronically recorded form. So now that they've said it, we got to write it down or record it electronically. Voluntariness is um, established along with the cooperation. So they try to make it seem like you're giving us this information all voluntarily, right? Oh, yes, sure, of course. So, but they don't realize that they have just been manipulated into saying what the police wanted them to say. Then the suspect signs the statement, which is even more <laughs> just disgusting. You just manipulated them into all that. And now you have them sign away their rights as to, yeah, I admitted to doing that crime. So post interrogation interview then begins after all that. Um, provide a method to determine the technique effectiveness, keep guilty suspect in proper frame of mind during the typing of the formal statement. So you can't let them go back to wait, wait, what did you guys just do to me? I'm innocent. Like in the Brendan Dassey interview, when they left the room for a minute and brought his mom in and she starts talking to him and he's like, yeah, they got to my head. And right at that moment, she's like, what? What do you mean by that? The police step in and he can no longer talk about the fact that the police got to his head about what happened and none of it really happened. <sighs> Drives me crazy. All right. And then... <laughs> Um, the post interrogation interview allows the interrogator to calm down an innocent suspect who was confronted. I don't know about that, but okay. So that, those are basically the nine, those are the nine steps of the read interrogation. And I'm going to pop back over. We're going to watch a video too, which is very interesting, but, um, I just wanted to pop back over to this, um, scientific paper, if you will. It's a study. Um, so I wanted to talk about the critiques and the controversies over the read technique. So the read technique has been subject of significant controversy and criticism within the field of law enforcement and criminal justice. While it has been widely utilized and taught for many years, since 1960, whatever, 62, 67, I don't remember, no. Um, concerns about its potential to elicit false confessions and its ethical implications have prompted reevaluations and the development of alternative approaches, which we have a very, very dire need for new and better approaches than the re-technique. Critics argue that the confrontational and psychologically manipulative nature of the read technique can lead to coerced or false confessions, particularly when used with vulnerable individuals such as the juveniles or those with intellectual disabilities, which Brandon is both a juvenile and had intellectual disabilities. The high pressure environment deceptive tactics and reliance on psychological manipulation have raised concerns about the reliability of confessions obtained through this method. From the perspective, read techniques, reliance on psychological manipulation, deceptive tactics, and the confrontational nature of the process can increase the risk of false confessions. Vulnerable individuals, such as those with low intelligence or minors, may be particularly susceptible to these tactics, leading to coerced or unreliable statements. The potential for ethical concerns and the need for safeguards in the interrogation process have sparked ongoing debates and discussions within the legal and psychological communities. I mean, it does definitely need more it needs help. It needs reform. What we're doing now needs to be better, it needs improvement. So research conducted by scholars such as Saul Casson and Richard Leo has shed light on the psychological dynamics of interrogations and the potential for false confessions. 
their work has raised important questions about the accuracy and validity of confessions obtained through the read technique, arguing or urging, sorry for caution, urging for caution and critical examination of its application. As response to those concerns, there have has been growing recognition of the need for evolving best practices in interrogation, alternative approaches that emphasize building rapport, establishing trust, and adopting a more empathetic and information-gathering approach have gained traction. Imagine that. Imagine that. Not being so adversarial to them. These approaches seek to strike a balance between obtaining truthful information and safeguarding the rights and well-beings of the individuals being interrogated. Maybe it will bring a little bit more trust back into the climate as well. Some jurisdictions have implemented reforms in their interrogation practices. These reforms aim to enhance transparency, protect suspects' rights, and minimize the risk of false confessions. Alternative approaches, such as the preparation and planning, engage and explain, account, closure, and evaluate, or peace, so that whole thing (laughs) is peace, model used in the United Kingdom emphasize a more non-confrontational and information gathering approach focusing on building rapport and understanding the suspect's perspective. Imagine that, listening to the suspect and actually believing that they might be telling the truth. (sighs) So this gets my passions all up in a uproar. All right, so (laughs) We're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about the science of false confessions. This is another um, scientific paper, and we're just going to talk about the, um, a few things that I had highlighted here. So early developments of false confessions. So according to Musterberg, 1908, he had laid the foundation for conceptualizing the three different types of false confessions. But it was not until the 1980s that further tangible theoretical developments took place. Casson, which we just were reading in the other one, Casson and Reitzman, through rigorous literature review, articulated that the three psychological types of false confessions which Musterberg had crudely obtained. They labeled them voluntary, which was not police-induced, coerced compliant, which was the result of not being able to cope with the custodial interrogative pressure and merely agreeing with the police, and coercive internalized, which means police persuade suspects that they committed the crime of which they are genuinely innocent types. So wait, police persuade suspects that they committed the crime of which they are genuinely innocent. Okay, so coerced, internalized, whatever. Um, And the other one is just not being able to cope with the interrogation skills. So despite some criticism and suggested refinements, the three classifications has withstood the passage of time. So I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'm just going to read through some of the highlighted portions. So what initially... uh, drove the resurgence of scientific interest in false confessions in the 1980s were two cases of miscarriage of justice in the 1970s, one of the US, in the USA and another one in the UK. They set the scene for a better understanding of the vulnerabilities of young people when manipulated by the police to extract a confession. In both cases, the confessions turned out to be false and police coerced. So we're not going to look at the actual... Um, cases that they're citing here in the 1980s that uh, they're talking about, but we're just going to look at some of the things that I thought were interesting. So young age is a well-recognized vulnerability to false confessions, requiring special procedural safeguards. We know... um, tests to I can't I don't remember what I was trying to bring up here (laughs) sorry tests to access these vulnerabilities oh there have been tests sorry there have been tests since then that 
can actually be used to assess someone's own like susceptibility to suggestion, you know, to other people's suggestions or being able to comply very easily with other people. Um, so there are tests that are that are used for just identifying if you are susceptible to changing your story to other people to fit other people's narratives, which in that in the case of being interrogated for a, a crime that you go to prison, you don't want to be susceptible. <laughs> I mean, but it's it happens. And there is that factor that needs to be taken into account. In fact, in Brendan's appeal, they talked about the fact that he was extremely Brendan Dassey, that he was extremely susceptible to um, outside suggestions. Next, um, I wanted to mention that this was this was the particular case that they're talking about here, but it says his weakness. So it, it could be anybody, just put anybody, anybody who is weak and not able to cope with interrogative pressure could easily give a false confession. Anyone who can't deal with the stress, the the pressure of engaging with an authority figure like that, you know, like law enforcement, sometimes you don't, you don't know what's going to happen until you're in that situation, number one. And number two, some people just cave and they, they will not bow down to authority, but almost in that sense, you know, they will comply because that's what they've been taught to do. That's what they think they are supposed to do. All right. So not only were explicit threats and promises during police interviews seen as risk factors for false confessions, but also false, false evidence ploy and minimization tactics that imply leniency by offering sympathy and moral justification. Like we know you, we know you probably did it because she was hurting the kids. So you only hurt her because of that reason. That's the sympathy, you know, you're minimizing the crime. So, or at least, you know, their motive or whatever the reason why they did it, you're minimizing that to them to make it seem like it's okay. Or, you know, you can understand. The experts also strongly agreed that the risk during police questioning is more prominent among adolescents, persons with compliant or suggestible personalities, and those with intellectual impairments and other mental health conditions. And Brendan is all of those. He is, or was at the time, an adolescent, a person with very, very strongly high suggestibility, person, uh, suggestibility rate, and also he is intellectually impaired. So he's got those three things going for him, or going against him, I should say, going for his, working towards contributing to his uh, confession that was coursed. Um, oh, some other interesting things that may happen when it comes to false confessions is a misclassification error. Uh, so... It's a false belief that officers can reliably tell, there is a false belief that officers can reliably tell that people are lying through nonverbal signs and um, having their gut feeling or a sixth sense, like this is our man. That's all bull. I mean, yes, we all have intuition and it might be true, but it doesn't mean, I mean, you need science, you need evidence, you need to back these things up before you just start accusing people of crimes. So a bias and lack of open-mindedness also can occur. St. Ives outlines several factors that can lead to bias and lack of openness during investigative interviews. These include undue weight being placed on first impressions, misleading perceptions of others. So like your family's a crappy family, so obviously you're crappy too, Brendan. So, you know... You obviously did it. People see what they expect to see. Exactly. Stereotypical thinking. The offender always lies and people or and police officers always tell the truth. That's stereotypical thinking. And that is a lot of people 
surprisingly still think that way in this country and it's so scary where they're like I'll just let the trial play out no no you need to pay attention to these things and you need to not let it go to trial if this person is innocent like why should they be subjected to the stress and having to go through you're probably sitting in prison until your trial happens so you have to go through that number one number two you have to pay for your trial or get public a public defender who will defend you zealously and that's not always easy to get someone that you like and yeah it's it's difficult anyways um so where was i misleading perception of others prejudices being less likely to give the benefit of the doubt to interviewees with a criminal history an unsubstantiated presumption of guilt so that like i've been saying on my channel police see you as guilty and then they will go backwards and you know that it's the backwards way to do it they see you as guilty and then they'll take the evidence and decide if you're not but once you put yourself into that spot and start confessing coerced to to a coerced confession you you start um helping them build that narrative and then they don't even have to investigate like we said so um unsubstantiated presumption of guilt they're yeah and they're treating you like the guilty person before you've even had your trial and a tunnel vision confirmation bias tunnel vision happens all the time in investigations that lead to false confessions um uh, the offender profiling so we hear about you know criminal profiling all the time and it obviously does have a huge impact on who's in prison now um and you know who's given false confessions and whatnot uh, another thing that we need to talk about is the flawed evidence in cases. So we know now that bite marks are bunk science. It's just, it's, it's junk. <laughs> bite marks aren't exclusive. We can't always tell how the human flesh reacts and then the flesh is dead. So you don't know from live, live to dead. You don't know how the the skin is going to react to those injuries of teeth impressions. Secondly, um, I lost my train of thought. It's junk science. Anyways, so the teeth marks, we used to think in, you know, science that those were accurate and we could use them. We know now that they're not. Uh, lie detector tests polygraphs we know now they're not accurate we know so much now that we didn't know uh bullet uh ballistics the bullet markings those are also junk science we know these things but when they come into trial because they'll still come into trial like in the delphi case where they're bringing in the the bullet that apparently cycled through rick Al richard allen's gun but it didn't eject or didn't fire but there's a bullet there even though that's not how the girls lives were ended but we're gonna tie that to Richard Allen and get a, a guilty f on him well now they the, de the defense has to come back with an expert to debunk any of that information that the state's going to bring about with ballistics because it's junk science. So they have to come back. And the fact that it's still allowed in court, I don't understand. But it's allowed in court by these experts that come in, experts that come in and <laughs> do this. And then the defense has to hire someone who is better at explaining the science and why it's junk science. And if they don't, then their expert loses and most likely they go to jail. So that's how that goes. Same thing with DNA evidence. Anytime you debunk DNA, there's still ways in which you have to collect it and things like that where it could be contaminated. You have to know the whole chain of custody. All those things need to come into play when you're talking about DNA. I don't know why I'm getting into like rants about this stuff. Sorry. But when it doesn't line up 
and you have bad expert witnesses telling people that this DNA is 100% exclusively belonging to this person when you can't say that. That person shouldn't be on the stand, in my opinion, saying those things. But anyways, misclassification can also happen um, when it's caused by trivial circumstantial, circumstantial evidence or clues or a highly speculative investigative hypothesis in overzealous investigators and prosecutors, such as the Ter- Teresa Halbach case. I mean, they went on all this speculation and really bad circumstantial evidence. And then I think, you know, planting evidence on top of that because they were so overly zealous. But still, that's a different story. So, yeah. Oh, I have more. Jeez. Okay. I think this is the end of that. Yeah. All right. So, in these other documents, papers, what, whatever have you got Garrett and the justice project have shown that the important, there is an important role of prison informants in causing miscarriages of justice too. So particularly in cases of unaliving through claiming that they heard the alleged suspects actually confess sometimes in graphic detail. Oftentimes they are given something in return, something, you know, like leniency in their case. We saw this in the Wisconsin versus Zachariah Anderson case where the informant, um, the main informant, the jailhouse informant against him made up this incredible story. At least it seemed very implausible that he was sleep sleeping. He was, he was in his sleep and he was saying in his sleep, die, 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 mother effer, and all this stuff. And then he admitted to me the next morning that he did it and he would do it again or something, you know, whatever his story was. But he had to make it dramatic and believable. And he received a promise of leniency in his sentencing in order to provide testimony in this other case. And it happens all the time. And I don't think it should be allowed, but it does happen. All right, so coercive error is another way. So once investigators have misidentified or misclassified the suspect, typically through misguided subjective deceptive detection and guilt presumption bias, they may use interrogative interrogative and custodial factors to coerce a confection from the suspect, particularly in high profile cases where police are under public and political pressure to solve the case. Um, Idaho 4, Delphi, Stephen Avery, like just to name a few off the top of my head. And these are like current ones. Karen Reed now, pressure to solve the case. Political pressure to solve a case. Delphi, anyone? Um, <laughs> it was right, it was just a few months before Liggett was Uh, voted into office as sheriff in Delphi that they arrested Richard Allen, which was five year. It was, which was out of the blue and five years after the crimes had happened. So that definitely seems like a political interest to me. Uh, The external pressure on police, as well as internally motivated factors, ambition, cognitive bias, feelings of power and control, and sense of expediency may lead to coercive interviewing tactics. The nine step read technique, the dominant interrogation model in the U S up to this day focuses on investigators identifying the suspects vulnerabilities and playing on them to obtain a confession. This has resulted in many cases of miscarriages of, du- of justice False confessions are a contributing factor to wrongful convictions in approximately 30% of exonerations in the U.S. And that was in 2020. And finally, my last point I wanted to make here was uh, that the read technique is comprised of two main manipulative techniques. Maximization, which is emphasizing the strength of the evidence or the evidence ploy. You increase the... um, you increase 
the anxiety that the suspect is having associated with the continued denial. So you keep throwing evidence out there and saying like this evidence relates to you. This evidence ties back to you. So they become more and more nervous about being called a suspect. And then minimization, which is the theme development and providing moral excuses for the crime. So again, you want to, you want to, you're, you're going to make your theme, you know, you did this because of this and you did it here. The, think of clue in the kitchen with candlestick. <laughs> That's your, your theme development. And then you're going to provide reasons why Like it's okay. We know he stole money from you. So obviously you were angry. Obviously, you know, anybody in your position would be. And that's how you get them to confess. So that was a very, oh, there's still more than I had. Oh, solitary confinement can be used if they're in prison or even just the threat of going to prison can be used for witnesses in some cases. Mm. Intimidation is often used, manipulation... Yeah, uh, contamination happens when um, when you get officers feeding information or per, or providing false narratives, false memories into that person. Sometimes you you can give people false memories. In the case of Stephen Avery, the first time he was wrongfully convicted. The police actually put false memories into the victim's mind as to who the person, who her attacker was. They described Stephen Avery to her. They gave Stephen Avery's picture in both lineups and they even showed her a picture of him. So she had his image in her mind and she took that and ran with it. And that was her memory of the, the perpetrator in her mind for many, many years many years. Stephen served 18 years in prison wrongfully for that. And she had the wrong memories because of police. Because police were so narrowly focused and tailored their everything on Stephen in that moment. And that's how he became the prime suspect. And then I'm going to leave it at that. One thing I wanted to bring up because I just read this in another video, which was from um, my Delphi update for the week, we read through this document in particular is about coerced confessions, actually. So um, I recommend if you want to go read or go to that video. Um, what's it called? Now I can't remember. It is Oh, gosh, I can't remember now. Let me go to my thumbnails here. So we're we're on the John Reed technique and course confessions, but in my video motion to suppress Alan's confessions from prison, that's the video that I was talking about. So we um I read through all of this. It's a motion to suppress his coerced confessions that were in prison. So it's exactly in line with what we're talking about here. So it, I'm going to state or cite the United States Supreme Court when it comes to coerced confessions that came out of Allen's um, most recent motion. That's what I'm looking at. So the Supreme Court states that coercion can be mental as well as physical and that the BLOOD of the accused is not the only hallmark of an unconstitutional inquisition. A number of cases have demonstrated, if demonstration were needed, that the efficiency of the rack and the thumb screw can be matched given the proper subject by more sophisticated modes of persuasion. A prolonged interrogation of an accused who is ignorant of his rights and who has been cut off from the moral support of friends and relatives is not infrequently an, an effective technique of terror. It is not so never mind okay so thus <laughs> the range of per of inquiry in this type of case must be broad and this court has insisted that the judgment in each instance be based upon consideration of the totality of circumstances so it can be 
just as effective as the rack or a thumb screw, which I believe both are like medieval or, you know, ancient like forms of tor torture. They could be the same as sophisticated forms of persuasion. Think about that. So somebody who is being physically tortured, it's almost the same as being manipulated and persuaded by this technique. I mean, they're not referencing the Reed technique specifically, but the Reed technique specifically tries to pull confessions out of you. So this is, you know, it's, a, it's very telling that you could get the same results from physical torture as you would just from being deceptive and manipulative and coercive in your way of getting the confession. So that's where I'm going to leave this, uh, you know, all the research stuff. And we're going to move on to a fun part, which is uh, um, we're going to watch a video on the re technique. So here we go. Let me uh, flip screens. And uh, here we go. on under the hood there is a method to the madness whoops sorry hold on let me slow that down i was listening fast but here we go <laughs> one of the main interrogation techniques that you'll see perpetuated is the read technique this is one of the primary interrogation techniques that is taught and utilized by over 500,000 police departments and law enforcement agencies in the united states the actual term the read technique of interviewing and interrogation is a registered trademark of john e reed and associates incorporated We'll take some time now to break down exactly what the read technique is, and we'll see it played out in a real-life interrogation. Keep in mind, however, that although this video is focused on the read method and understanding it better, no technique is perfect, and the read technique has come under its own amount of valid scrutiny and criticism, which we'll touch on towards the end of the video. But for now, let's understand what the read technique actually is. The read interrogation technique on paper is nine steps. However, the method as a whole involves three components. Factual analysis analyzing what is known about the suspect prior to the interrogation and comparing that with what is known about the crime. Behavior analysis or interviewing, where the investigator talks to the subject in a much more casual, totally non-accusatory way to establish a baseline normal behavior of the subject before getting into the third component, interrogation. Interrogation is where the main steps of the read technique take place. All the steps of the read technique are meant to be implemented during the line of questioning, and only when the investigator is reasonably certain of the subject's involvement or guilt. We'll go more into this particular aspect of this method later on, but use of this technique somewhat hinges on the assumption that the person being questioned is most likely guilty. There are very few provisions within this method of actually determining innocence or guilt. It is really on the investigating officer to come to that determination on their own. So what are the steps of the read technique? Glad you asked. Step one is direct confrontation. This step can take place at any point after the interrogation has begun. This can be one of the first things the interrogation officer does, or it can happen an hour plus into the questioning. This direct confrontation is meant to inform the suspect that there is unequivocal evidence that points directly at them. At this point, there is an opportunity for the suspect to admit their guilt, but that typically doesn't happen. This step is the setup for the more pointed, direct conversation to follow. Step two is shifting the blame, also known as theme development. More than likely, the suspect will not be immediately forthcoming to admit guilt or wrongdoing. So to make it easier, Step 2 of the read technique has the interrogating officer creating a narrative that allows the suspect to begin to admit some guilt, even if the narrative isn't exactly accurate. One example of this would be if someone is suspected of murder. The interrogating officer might create the narrative by saying something like, Well, in talking to you here, you don't seem like a cold-blooded killer to me. So maybe you felt threatened. Maybe you felt like there was no other option. Did you feel that way? Now, this explanation could be completely inaccurate to the actual details of what occurred. But if the suspect bites on it and admits to even a small part of the narrative made by the officer, that will make it easier down the line to extract more and more information, hopefully leading to a genuine confession. Step 3 is handling denials. What an interrogating officer doesn't want is for the guilty suspect to garner enough mental fortitude to withstand the pressure of the line of questioning. The more slack you give someone to dig their heels in, the more likely they will continually deny the accusations. Exactly. You don't want them to, con to reaffirm that they are innocent because it just helps reaffirm it out loud and in their minds. If you give them the opportunity to say, I'm innocent, then you're allowing them to reaffirm it. So you don't want that. That's why you're making them deny it. 
and if these denials are not addressed, it's likely that they will get more and more adamant as the questioning continues. Therefore, step three of the read technique has the interrogating officer swiftly and firmly dismissing any denials from the subject and discouraging them from initiating any further denials. Just an interesting note on this. Those who put stock in the read technique are more likely to subscribe to the notion that innocent suspects will ignore step three and from the very beginning to the very end of questioning, vehemently deny any involvement. Guilty subjects will ask for permission to speak or passively look for an opportunity to speak, and when they do so, they will imply their innocence, not outright state it in the way an innocent person might be likely inclined to do. Step four, apply their innocence, not outright let's, let's just say that again. Okay, so innocent subjects persistently and vehemently express their innocence. Guilty suspects will look for opportunities to speak and imply their innocence, not state it outright. According to the read technique maybe. State it in the way an innocent person might be likely inclined to do. Step four is similar, overcoming objections. This is similar to step three, but rather than an outright denial, an objection would be the suspect justifying why they couldn't possibly be involved with what they were being accused of doing. I could never kill her. I loved her. Or, I love my job and all of my co-workers. I would never smash in all the windows of the office before lighting my boss's car on fire and rolling it down the hill. Step five is procurement and retention of the suspect's attention also sometimes known as reinforcing sincerity. The interrogating officer doesn't want the suspect to focus on the punishment or in all of the ways their life could change for the worse after they admit what they did. Focusing on any such negativity could push the subject further and further away from admitting what they've done. Rather, the read technique encourages interrogating officers to focus on why they should admit what they've done. Step six is somewhat similar. Handling the subject's passive mood. It goes without saying that in some cases, a subject who is being accused of serious wrongdoing and whose entire life could change as a result of what happens next, might be inclined to simply shut down. The interrogating officer needs to stop them from fully shutting down, and keep them focused on getting to the point where they can talk about the crime. Step 7 is another technique to get the subject even closer. Fully shutting down would be like not talking at all, or saying like, I need a lawyer, which law enforcement doesn't want you to say because they want to keep interviewing you without legal representation. So that, of course, they want to handle your passive mood. So when you start to become less cooperative, they're going to take measures to change or shift gears in the conversation so that you don't totally check out and decide I need a lawyer or I'm not going to talk, I'm just going to sit here or whatever. Closer to a confession, presenting an alternate question. This typically involves the officer posing two scenarios as to why the subject would have committed the crime. One being more socially acceptable than the other, to try to shoebox the suspect into picking one and essentially admitting guilt. For example, an interrogator might say, are you just a cold-blooded killer? Or did things just get out of hand? Or, did you plan this out? Or did this just happen spur of the moment? Step eight is having the suspect orally relate various details of the offense. Wanting the subject to essentially- Remember, both are like assuming guilt, but one's just a little less bad in their minds because they minimize it. But both options are, you're guilty. There's no other option. Actually, verbally confess to details of the crime might seem self-explanatory as far as value, but it's good to note the structure that the read technique expects this to take. The interrogating officer first asks very broad, general questions about the offense and allows the subject to fill in the gaps. After that first pass, the interrogator will then go back again, this time asking more detailed questions, clearing up anything that may have been missed or clarifying anything that may not have lined up. And finally, step nine, converting an oral confession to a written confession. Very few things trump not only a video recorded verbal confession followed by a signed written confession when we're talking about someone being convicted and sentenced of a crime. This is the goal of almost every case of which the main suspect is being interrogated by police. They confess. Now, due to the varied nature of people, how they react to certain situations, their mental fortitude, their temperament, and even the varied nature of the officers attempting to implement this method, these steps aren't always implemented in the most direct or obvious or even effective way. Sometimes an officer will only be able to really utilize two or three of the steps and never quite get the confession they wanted. In order to properly see the re-technique in action, it would be prudent to look at what might be one of the most famous interrogations of all time, the interrogation of Russell Williams. Now, hold on before you click off the video thinking, well, I've seen this interrogation a dozen times analyzed on a dozen different channels. You're absolutely correct. This is probably the most famous interrogation video on the internet today. And if you are at all interested in this type of video, which your presence here on my channel indicates you are, chances are you've seen this interrogation before, maybe two or three times even. That being said, we will only look at a small slice of this interrogation, done by the now legendary Jim Smith. 
and we will not be hyper-analyzing the behavior of Russell Williams or his body language as he's confronted with the terrible truth of what he's done, but rather going through the methods that Jim Smith uses to extract information and how this relates to the steps in the read technique. For the small percentage of you who need context, Russell Williams was a former colonel in the Canadian Armed Forces who was eventually charged with two counts of first-degree murder. Two women, Jessica Lloyd and Marie France Como. Two counts of forcible confinement, two counts of breaking and entering, and sexual assault. The primary piece of evidence that led investigators to bring him in for questioning were the tire treads on his SUV that matched the tire treads found at one of the murders. A couple of things worked in tandem to make this case and interrogation as famous as it is. Number one, his high status in the Canadian military. Number two, the comprehensive documentation of the interrogation, in which he confessed to these crimes in great detail and the methods that were used to get that information. And number three, the fact that if he wasn't caught when he was, it is most likely he would have killed again, turning him into a full-fledged serial killer. Like I said, we will only analyze a small part of this interrogation as it pertains to the read technique. However, if you want to see a full analysis of this case and interrogation in its entirety, I highly recommend you check out the Jim Can't Swim or Matt Orchard videos which cover this case in a more comprehensive way than I could ever hope to. Now, let's begin. This is getting beyond my control. Right? I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house and I need to know why. We're starting pretty deep into the interrogation, about 40 minutes in. At this point, a number of pieces of evidence have been leveled at Williams that clearly point to his involvement in the murder. They have presented to him his matching tire treads that were found near the home of the victim. They have told him an officer saw a vehicle with a description matching his parked in a field near the victim's home shortly before the murder took place, and they are now showing him footwear impressions that match those found at the crime scene. We can consider this step one of the read technique, direct confrontation. Jim Smith has shown the evidence to Williams. He is now giving Williams a chance to explain how this happened on his own. He's letting him sit with the evidence presented and seeing if that in itself is enough to get him talking. Well, I don't know what to say. It's, um, well, you need to explain it because this is the other problem we're having, Russell. Okay. Again, these decisions are made by me. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a search warrant being executed at your residence in Ottawa. Okay. So your wife now knows what's going on. There's a search warrant being executed at the, your residence in Tweed, and your vehicle's been seized. Okay. You and I both know they're going to find evidence that links you to these situations. Okay. You and I both know that the unknown offender, male, male on Marie France Combo's body, is going to be matched to you, quite possibly before the evening's over. Okay. This is a major investigation. The Center of Forensic Sciences on call 24 hours a day, helping us with this. Mm -hmm. Your opportunity to take some control here, and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring because mm. this is how credibility works all right and i know you're an intelligent person and you probably don't need to hear this explanation but i also know your mind's racing right now okay because i've sat across a lot of people in your position over the years mm. okay the bottom line is is that as soon as we get that that piece of evidence that solidifies it mm. dna okay as soon as the expert in footwear impressions the expert in tire impressions calls and says, yes, I've examined those and they're a match, mm -hmm. it's all over. Because as soon as that happens. So at this point, they don't even have any testing back. They just say, well, we have this and it's going to come back matching you no matter what. We know it's you because we have these foot impressions and tire impressions. So it's, it, this is what I don't understand. Why do cops come at you with, I mean, they don't even have the exact test results yet. Like with Brian Koberger and the whole IgG thing and did they even have him you know before the IgG I don't know it's all confusing with that but anyways um yeah so it's very easy to get a confession using these the style of questioning where's your credibility where's your believability you're just another uh, and Again, don't take this wrong, okay? But you can see if you step outside this room in your mind and imagine how people are going to view you, okay? If the truth comes out after the clear evidence is presented to you, when you finally go, okay, I'm screwed now, mm -hmm. what are we going to do? 
The second step in the read technique is theme development. As we said, this is mainly used to develop a narrative that allows the suspect to begin to admit to the crime they committed, whether that narrative is true or not. The narrative, or justification created by the interrogator, is simply a gateway for the suspect to begin speaking on their crimes. For instance, perhaps a suspect stole something. If an investigator were to ask them point blank, why did you steal this item? That might be far too confrontational for the suspect at this point, and they may shut down, or worse, it could trigger a series of hard denials. But, if it's presented in a different way, did you feel like that item actually belonged to you? Did you feel like that individual didn't deserve that item? Did you plan on returning it at some point? That is much less confrontational and allows the suspect to slowly start to admit what they did without it being thrust on them all at once. Here, Jim Smith is Makes not sense. providing Williams a justification for what he did. Instead, he tells Williams that the longer he waits to speak on what he's done, the less credibility he has. The less credibility he has, the more others will be able to control the narrative of what happened, why he did what he did, and what his motivations were. You might say that this technically doesn't fit into step two of the read technique, but think about the goal of the second step. The goal of the second step is to provide a bridge for the suspect to begin to admit what they've done, regardless of the method that's used to do so, whether it's creating a narrative or gently motivating the suspect to speak for fear that they'll lose credibility. At the end of the day, it's meant to accomplish the same goal. Russell, you know there's only one option. What do you, what do you, what other option is there? What's the option? Well, I don't think you want the cold-blooded psychopath option. I might be wrong. Because okay, don't get me wrong, I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety, got off on it, got off on having that label, Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. This is over. And you can have a, a bad ending where Jessica's parents continue to wonder where her daughter's lying. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a huge search still underway, and it'll continue. It'll continue until her body's found. That might even happen tonight, for all I know. Let's briefly skip to step six which is handling the suspect's passive mood. Passive mood here is more of a general term, since how a suspect will react to being confronted with evidence of a crime they committed will vary. It will vary on the individual. Some might put on a more stoic, hardened appearance, some might become downcast or even begin crying. Others, like Williams, might sit in almost stunned silence as their head races to picture every scenario as well as what their future will look like from this point forward. How the suspect reacts will also depend on the severity of the crime. Was it petty larceny? Was it Grand Theft Auto? Was it assault? Was it murder? All of these things can play into a suspect's passive mood. The way Jim Smith handles William's passive mood here is by steadily reinforcing his need to tell the truth and come clean with what happened. He frequently says things like, This is over, implying that the only option now is to tell the truth, if only for the reason that at least he has a say in the narrative going forward. This also goes to show that with some of the steps of the read technique, it is not a linear path. Every interrogation, line of questioning, and case is different, and requires different methods. But very often, those methods will line up with the nine steps that we're going through here, in one form or another. Once that happens, then I don't know what other cards you would have to play. What are we going to do? Jessica somewhere we can find her easily? Like, is this something where I can make a call and tell somebody to go to a location and they're going to find her, or is this something where we have to go and, and uh, take a walk? So, there's a reason why I left in a lot of William's silence in this portion of the interrogation. Here we're going to discuss steps 3 through 5 of the read technique. Steps 3 and 4, handling denials and overcoming objections, both have to do with the investigator shutting down any sort of self-defense denial system that the suspect may exhibit. It is well known, especially among investigator and interrogators, that allowing a suspect to repeatedly profess innocence or deny what they did can only serve to mentally bolster them and make it less likely for them to confess at all. So, an investigator would want to make sure that this is snuffed as soon as possible. Russell Williams doesn't do any of that. He doesn't profess innocence, he doesn't defend himself, he doesn't deny the accusations being leveled against him. He's just silent. 
That is where step 5 comes in. Procurement and retention of the suspect's attention. Jim Smith cannot allow Russell Williams to get lost in his own head and risk him sh shutting down, at least before he begins admitting to and giving details about his crimes. In order to retain a suspect's attention, the re technique suggests closing the distance between the investigator and the suspect. Jim Smith is already fairly close to Williams, as Williams is backed into the corner of the room. Smith also doesn't let silence hang too long before snapping Williams back to reality in a small, subtle way, constantly reminding him that he needs to address what is happening right now, needs to tell the truth, needs to admit what he's done. However, on the flip side, Jim Smith also realizes that it is just as effective to allow Williams to stew in the silence for a little bit, allow him to be overwhelmed by all of the emotions and thoughts flooding through his head. That being said, we will skip ahead a little bit. Most of the two minutes or so is Williams sitting in silence as he contemplates not only his next move, but undoubtedly the ways in which his life will drastically change from here on out. So what am I doing, Russ? I put my best foot forward here for you, but... I really have. I don't, I don't know what else to do to, to make, make you understand the impact of what's happening here. Do we talk? I want to um, minimize the impact on my wife. So do I. So how do we do that? Well, we start by telling the truth. Where is she? Get him out. That triumphant moment that is and should be the highlight of any channel trying to analyze I'm sorry, I've never seen this inter interrogation before, so this is new to me, so I'm enjoying this. Um, <laughs> I don't know, uh, I, this takes place in Canada, I believe. I remember his face when he was in the news, but I didn't really pay attention to what was going on. So this is kind of new to me. So I am that small percentage that needed to know who he was. <laughs> this case or interrogation, do you got a map symbolizes the metaphorical dam shattering in William's head as reality finally catches up with him and he realizes the best option for him now is to cooperate. This would fall into step 8, having the suspect orally relate various details of the offense. Now that Williams has finally crossed over to the other side and is willing to share details of what he's done, starting with the locations of the bodies of Jessica Lloyd on a map, Jim Smith can now press a little harder for other details of his crimes, details with which Williams proceeds to be very open about. This would flow into step 9, which is a written confession, one of the ultimate conviction tools. I tie her up. I tie her up. Some uh, rope pipe front. So she's on her stomach. How are you tying her up? Just tying her hands behind her back. Okay. She got clothes on at that point? Mm -hmm. What kind of clothes? S sweats. All right. So tie her hands behind her back, and then, then what happens? I took her clothes off. Okay. And then what happened? I raped her. Now, of course, no technique is perfect and no strategy will work every single time, especially when you consider the wide variety of ways a person could respond to interrogation and questioning. The read technique is no different and has come across its own scrutiny and criticism. We'll go through some of those criticisms now. The first and possibly most apparent is that much of the read technique hinges on the investigator's ability to discern what is true and what is false. Unfortunately, an analysis of nonverbal behavior to determine if an individual is telling the truth isn't always the most accurate, and can also vary depending on the person, the situation, and even the time of day or season. 
Look at this excerpt from one of Stan Walters' talks where he speaks on determining if someone is lying or not. For reference, Stan Walters is an expert in the area of determining truth and deception as it relates to law enforcement and military interrogations. There's at least 35 empirical studies that show that there is no correlation between eye contact and deception. You know that? This one of the most persistent myths worldwide. There's studies that show that some subjects, about 40% of our population, actually increase eye contact when they're being deceptive. They look at you more when they're lying than when they're telling the truth. That's one of the first things people write down. Or you probably got this one. Here's one of those myths that's perpetuated horrendously within law enforcement. If you ask a question to the left, he's recalling. If you ask a question to the right, he's constructing. You know, if you ask a question to the left, he's recalling, so he's telling the truth. If you ask a question to the right, he's making it up, so anybody breaks eye contact to the right is lying. How many of you thought that? It's garbage. There's over 100 published studies in the last five years alone show there's absolutely no correlation at all to eye movement and deception. But it's thoroughly embedded in federal agencies, in military and intelligence agencies. I can tell you, I talked to all of them. The traditional ways that people believe they can discern whether or not someone is lying, limited eye contact, defensive posture, looking up and to the left or right, even perspiration, can't be fully relied on due to the fact that many times these reactions are variable and change depending on the individual. Richard Leo, a law professor, is quoted as saying regarding determining deception and the effectiveness of the read technique, people are poor at making accurate judgments of truth and deception in general. Behavior cues police rely on in particular are not diagnostic of deception, and investigators cannot distinguish truthful from false denials of guilt at rates significantly greater than chance, but instead routinely make confidently held yet erroneous judgments. The argument against this by those who are defenders of the traditional way of determining truth, as well as the company who teaches the read technique, is that these studies simply didn't cover enough actual police interrogations, and rather were done in college labs, where participants had low motivation to hide deception the way an actual suspect of a crime would. A second, major criticism of the Reed Technique is the fact that many believe it could lead to false confessions. Since the Reed Technique is very guilt-presumptive in nature, that is, treating the subject as guilty right from jump rather than holding the belief that the subject being interviewed could possibly be innocent, could cause a snowball effect for the interrogator to incorrectly gauge a suspect's guilt, which could motivate that interrogator to pressure the suspect into a partial or full false confession. This can happen via three channels. Misclassification. This is when the investigator attributes deception to truthful or innocent suspects based on what they believe is dishonest behavior or nonverbal cues. We went through this in the first criticism. Coercion. This could fall into the category of psychological manipulation. This could be anything from threatening inevitable consequences, making a promise of leniency in return for a confession, denying a subject their rights, or even conducting an excessively long interrogation. Here is a clip from a previous video of mine regarding the I-10 shooter in which police attempt to coerce an innocent suspect into admitting guilt. It has been scientifically analyzed by our crime lab, okay. and it has been shown that mm -hmm. bullets that were recovered from our crime scenes came from that gun. Okay, now... And that's false. That's junk science. It cannot be true, because you cannot tell. You can say markings on that casing are consistent with other casings that were ejected from that gun, but you cannot say without a doubt that it came from that gun. You cannot. Is there uh, someone can explain me how my gun got upon without me? Absolutely. We I seized it. We seized it. Okay. Okay. Um, obviously, we've done a lot of work on this and done a lot of investigative work. Talked to a lot of people. You just saw a couple people that we've talked to today. We've talked to numerous people regarding this. Numerous people that know you. And uh, so we got to feel. I have no idea. How. I mean, never get in the Well, here's here's the thing. Nobody's been hurt yet. Okay, but okay. I'm you, sir, nobody got hurt. Fire. Nobody got hurt. A single shot on the freeway. Well, I'm sorry. I go down the shooter road and I go down the back yard and I shoot the water. Here, listen, listen. I'm not going to argue the facts with no, you. No, I understand. So but I have the facts. I have the facts in here. Okay, and what I'm here is obviously this. That's another technique that they do is to bring in a file uh, that's empty, completely empty, but they say they act like it's a stack of paperwork on you, and they've been doing research, or you know, they've been investigating forever on you and they make it seem like all their answers are in this stack of paperwork that they never open <laughs> doesn't look good yeah okay yeah, I mean, it's a and shock to me bro people people do things maybe they're having a bad day maybe they're frustrated maybe things are going that's on in their personal life that's not me well, 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 notice he is backed in the corner there's a table in front of him two law enforcement officials there and he cannot escape he's stuck right 
in that room being interrogated by these officers. Well, like I said, I hurt somebody. Your weapon was involved in it. I got video in there. I got video in there. So if you need to see that video to sit there and prove the point, rather than being okay, a man, so rather than being been, a man and just admit I'll tell you where I've been. I went to 44th Street and Chandler Boulevard because I have a job there. Her name's Nancy Lutz. We did her yard. This has nothing to do with anything to do. This has account. nothing to do with your work or any of this. Okay, well, I'm telling you, I have not found You're familiar with what I am telling you. Yes, you sir. know. Yeah, but I'm telling you, I follow them. I can't follow shit. I'm not even talking about your Facebook anymore. I'm, I'm talking, I'm talking, there's, there, there's no, it, it's just not out of the blue that you're here, Leslie. You, you, you it know? really is, because I'm not following it's, my it's not, it's, it's, it's not out of the blue. You're here for a reason. Here's the thing. I know what happened. I'm I just sure. don't know why. And the only person that has that answer is you. No, I can't tell you why, because I didn't do it. I don't know how to tell you or what to make you, what to say here, man. Well, uh, well, what I'm trying to figure out is why it happened. A lot but of I, I don't know what to tell you on that, dude. My gun is man. Okay, so why was someone who's kind of close to you tell you that they think you are capable of going and doing something like this? Oh, was that my boss? You get a hold of me asking that? No, no, just saying, you just said somebody close to you. Why would somebody close to you sit there and say that you were capable of doing it? Dude, if you get a polygraph yeah, right now, if you get a polygraph right now, I'll pass that shit because I have not. So you're willing to take a polygraph? I'll fucking take one right now, dude. Okay, oh, no. you weren't doing the shootings. Yes, sir. I spoke with your wife earlier mm -hmm. and she said that she was with you on the 29th mm -hmm. all day. Mm -hmm. She said she was with you all day the 30th. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's a weekend, man. We're together all weekend. Well, I'm just asking you. Not, not. Yeah, I happens. think, I believe, yes, is, that the, is that the case? I'm with my wife every weekend. Okay. Any day I'm not at work, I'm with so, my wife and kids. So if that's the case, and these are dates that these shootings occurred, and you're telling me that you didn't do the shooting, so, no, so are you Fuck telling me? No, so all right, then, well, then look at where I'm coming with this. So somebody no, had to do it. It wasn't my wife. It wasn't me, man. Contamination. Contamination is when an interrogating officer leaks information regarding the case that wasn't made public to the suspect in the interrogation room. After a false confession is coerced out of them, the suspect might then instinctively incorporate that non-public information as part of their confession, which could make them look even more guilty. The argument for defenders of the Reed technique say that false confessions are not a direct result of the technique itself, but the problem really lies in the misapplication of tactics to discern truth, as well as officers who operate improperly beyond the boundaries of the method. As we discussed earlier, Reed is not the only interrogation method out there. There are quite a number of other, similarly effective interrogation techniques that are used throughout the world. For example, England uses the PEACE method, which stands for Preparation and Planning, Engage and Explain, Account, Closure, and Evaluate. We won't go into too much detail of this method here, but as a brief overview so you can compare it to the Reed technique used in the US, the preparation and planning phase sees the interrogating officers developing a game plan and objectives for questioning even before they step into the room. The engage and explain phase is where the interrogators establish a rapport with the suspect and explain the reasons for the questioning and what they hope to get out of it. Account is gathering the suspect's series of events. Closure is to prevent an abrupt end to the interrogation, summarizing events and clearing up any unclear details. And evaluate is the post-interview analysis where the interrogators analyze the subject version of events and see if it lines up with the rest of the case. There are a number of other- That definitely seems better to me than the re-technique. I don't know, what do you guys think? Other alternative interrogation techniques and methods. Some rely heavily on the interrogator's ability to determine if non-verbal cues indicate dishonesty. Some rely more on the actual verbal communication between the subject and the interviewer. Some are simply a method of procedure for interrogators to use to make sure that the line of questioning flows smoothly. But as effective as these methods are, especially watching them back and analyzing them during the most compelling police interrogations, such as the Russell Williams interrogation, no method works 100% of the time. So, to conclude, I'll leave you with the ultimate combatant to any police interrogation technique. Uh, I understand you, you said you'd be willing to talk to me about wearing your handcuffs? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, being it is a criminal investigation, obviously you're not free to go because you have warrants for your arrest. Um, I'm going to read your Miranda because it's very important you understand your rights. Okay. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have them present with you while you're being questioned. If you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before the question if you wish. You can decide at any time to exercise these rights and not answer any questions or make any statements. Do you understand each of these rights I've explained to you? Yes, sir. Have you previously asked any other law enforcement officer to allow you to speak to an attorney about this incident? Have these rights in mind, do you wish to talk to me now? No, sir. I'm sorry? What? Have these rights in mind, do you wish to talk to me now? No, sir. You don't want to talk to me? I just call me Okay, you can call your mom at the jail. All right. We'll get you out of here as quick as we can. Yep. No matter how well researched, how prepared, how skilled of an interrogator someone is, nothing beats an old fashioned stone wall. And I encourage all of you to go ahead and 
ask to exercise that right to an attorney if you are ever in a situation where you are being interrogated by the police you should absolutely not speak <laughs> remain silent and wait for an attorney because even if they send you to prison for a few hours until you can get an attorney whatever an attorney will be provided to you at no cost if that is um your wish if you decide that you don't want to speak and i encourage that because anything you say will not can will be used against you in your trial so that's all i'll say about that so just be in my be mindful now that confessions false coerced confessions happen more than anyone would ever like to admit and this read technique that probably three quarters of the U.S. law enforcement uses today really has some problems and it should be reevaluated what we're doing now. So that's all I want to say about that. Thank you so much for sticking with me. I appreciate you watching. Um, I know this topic is just near and dear to my heart because I, anyone that spends a day in prison who is innocent and are being treated as guilty, it's a crime in my opinion. So hopefully this gives everybody a little bit more of an understanding of what would it, they could expect if they were ever interrogated by officers and how to avoid being talked into, coerced into a confession. You want to make sure that you engage your right to a lawyer and proclaim your innocence because they don't want you to. <laughs> so that's what I would do. Be like, I'm innocent and I want a lawyer and leave it at that. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in the next one. Take care. If you've been impacted by a true crime and would like your story told in your own words, or if you or someone you know has been wrongfully convicted or accused of a crime, please write to crimeincourtchannel at gmail.com and tell us your real true crime encounters. Thanks for watching.